They'd wear the same clothes for months and months uh, with it. Uh, that doesn't change even if they're in their 30s and 40s, I hear. But uh, uh, anyway, this is a great day. This is Father's Day, and, and I, uh, if you saw the sign, I make no apologize, uh, apologies for the sign. We're not confused here. What is a man? What is a woman? There's no confusion. God has created two genders, only two genders. I heard a, a uh, I have listened to some of his, I, I would never, I won't give the name nor recommend the person. He's the most vile, wicked man that I've ever heard preach, if that's what you call it. And uh, he said to his church, he said, I wish that God would have made it a little easier. A, B, and, and, and a C, and a D. And because someone who's born in C and D would say, God, I just, I don't know who I am. And I said, it has nothing to do with C and D. I don't know who I am is what you're saying is I wish God would have made it a little easier in that he justifies my sin. That's the whole thing. I want God to agree with me about my wickedness. God's made it really easy. A man and a woman, that's it. Nothing different. Now, you look at our society today, you look at what is being pushed, you look at what is uh, the agenda, understand it has been uh, for, for many years, if you were to watch a, uh, a sitcom or a 30-minute show on TV, the man in most all shows is made to look like a big buffoon. He's unintelligent, he's unorganized, he's basically a retard that's being run by his wife. Why? Because if you take authority, and now let me stop for a second, I saw some smiles. <laughs> and you're thinking, well, that's just truth, preacher. But we don't want to say that here. Uh, the fact is, uh, the truth is that God has created women strong. In and of themselves, they're very strong. But a woman was created to follow leadership. I'll say something here. I've said it before. God never created the woman for fellowship with him, ever. God created the woman as a completer to her husband. God created the man for fellowship with him. The Bible says, I will make him and help meet. Does that mean a woman cannot fellowship with God? Of course she can. Of course she can fellowship with God. Of course she can pray to God. Of course she can get things from God. Of course all of those things. But if you can take the authority out of the home, you destroy a family, you destroy a church, you destroy a nation. There is an end game to what is going on in our society. Let's remove God. Let's remove the authority of the home. Now, I can preach any message. I mentioned this on Mother's Day. I can preach any message in the Bible but one. Submission. Wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Now you're meddling. Now you're taking some rabbit trails. We look at and say the wife is equal with the husband. Wives, you are not equal with your husband. God will answer, a man will answer to God for his home. I will give an account of my home to God. My wife will not give an account of our home. I will. Because of the leadership that he has placed. My wife said to me here several years ago, we will uh, be married uh, um, 34 years this, next, this coming Saturday. It's our 34th anniversary. It also is 21 years ago that we moved here uh, to New Hope Baptist Church on the 24th. My wife said to me, she said, Honey, I want you to understand something. Now, if you know my sweet wife, um, under that beautiful uh, facade, under that uh, beautiful face behind that, uh, she, can, she can be a, a 
She could be meaner than a striped rattlesnake. <laughs> Let's just call it what it is. Um, you think, oh, she just is, yes. <laughs> that is why we're going out to eat today. Uh, that is also why I'm camping at my son's house today um, <laughs> as well. Uh, now listen, man, let's, let's just make no bones about it. You could say the same thing about your wife as well. I'm trying to get myself out of a little bit, and if you'll shake your head, I might even give you two candy bars out of this one. <laughs> my wife said to me many years ago, she said, and we were talking about in preparing a message to speak at a couple's retreat, and she said, understand something. It is impossible for me to submit to you if I didn't submit to God first. Because I have surrendered my life to God, it's very easy for me to surrender my life to you. As long as you lead the home biblically, I have no problem following you. And so you look at society, they want to remove that from society. They want chaos. They want confusion. And Satan is the author of confusion. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse number 15, you find God creating the first family. The Bible says in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 2, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it, and to keep it. Uh, let, let, me, let me go back and say something, because I, I don't want to lose this thought for a second. When I said that God never created the woman for fellowship with Him, and I say that you are not equal with your husband, that is not putting the woman down. The woman should never, ever be used as a whipping post. Do you realize the last thing that God created was the woman. God created nothing after the woman. Everything we have was created out of what was already here. The woman was the last thing that God created. She is the crown of completion. I believe she ought to be treated in accordance to God's Word. She ought to be loved. She ought to be cared for. She ought to be uh, 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 reverenced by her husband. When you get married, you have no right. Well, you know, I'm married. I can't touch, but I can look. No, you cannot look. You cannot touch something else. Your eyes are only for your wife. That's it. And we'll say a few things, and, and you might say, well, this message this morning is to fathers. No, the message is for everybody in here. But again, in verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam said, or Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he the woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh." And they were both naked, and uh, naked the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, there may be some, again, saying, well, this message is not for me. I'm not married. I don't have children. They're growing. But all of us have a family. And so the message is for everyone this morning. And I want us to think about some things in this. And back it says, I will make. 
In verse 18, God said, I will make, I will make. I will make man and help meet a completer, a finisher. And so I want us to look at that here for just a moment. We're going to talk about the family and what does it take to, 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 to make a strong family. It is vitally important. I cannot control what happens outside of my home. I can vote, I can be involved, but I cannot control it. But I can control what's in my home. I can control what I allow to come into my home. I can control me. So what does it take to have a strong family? Well, I, I, there's all kinds of books out there. There's some good books that give you good pointers and can help you out in many areas. There's some books that will destroy, some books that will hurt the marriage. Now, I know what God's Word says, but... Anytime you see, I know what God's Word says, but throw the book away. I know what God's Word says, and this is what He's saying. I believe that the best book for marriage is the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? What does the, gird, the Lord want for us? I want you to turn over, hold your fingers there, but turn over to Genesis, or Psalm 127 for just a moment. In Psalm 127, this is in the middle of 15 psalms known as a song of degrees. And so there's 15 psalms, seven before, seven after. In the middle of these 15 psalms is Psalm 127. Uh, when, it, when it talks about in the heading there, a song of degrees for Solomon or by Solomon. And this psalm is dealing with the family. In verse number one, it says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Now, if anybody knew anything about building, it would have been Solomon. Solomon was the one who was allowed to build the first temple. The tabernacle was one that was movable. The temple was, was sound, secure, had a foundation. And so God used Solomon to build a magnificent temple. And so he understood uh, architecture. He understood how to build. And he's saying, listen, if you want to have a strong home, if you want to have a strong family, you have to have the right foundation. And except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. Back in Genesis 2.18, the Bible says, God said, I will make man and help me. I will build the home. And if you follow this, I will build a strong home. Everybody knows that a foundation is the most important part of any building is a strong foundation. A weak foundation gives you a, a weak building. A weak building will crack. A weak building will fall apart. Now, that doesn't mean that the building never needs maintenance. The building still needs maintenance. So Solomon understood this. You know, I think that looking at this, it reminds us of the centrality of finding this chapter in the middle and how important family is. You know, I know that, and, and you know this, that a nation is only as strong as the families that make up the nation. This church is only as strong as the families that make up the church. When you see what's happening in society, that is a reflection of the home. We will, uh, this next year, we will have an election. We just had an election two years ago. We did not, that was not a choice, that was a consequence for our lack of taking a stand on biblical principles and upon the Word of God. We need to take a stand upon God's Word. I don't care what society says. What does God's Word teach? So you look at this, uh, th th this passage of Scripture. Solomon understood what it meant. Now, Jesus Christ is also a builder. He came from Nazareth. His father was a carpenter. Jesus helped his father. 
Now, I believe that uh, Jesus is involved as, as well today in some building projects. I believe that uh, every, every person ought to have three homes. They ought to have a heavenly home, the most important thing. We ought to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We ought to have a good church home where they preach and teach the Word of God. You know, I just want to go to a church where I fit in. I just want to go to a church where I can just feel, oh, I do not want to go to a church where they step on my toes. I do not like that. I mean, can you imagine going to a church and leave with conviction upon you? That would be horrible. No, we ought to go to church and say, God, speak to me. And if you have to, jump all over me. And if you have to, kick me around a little bit. Now, that isn't fun, but we ought to go to a church where the Holy Spirit is working, where the Bible is preached and taught. Now, listen, I know what God's Word says, but let me give you my thoughts. I don't care about your thoughts. What does the Word of God say? No, I can say, I believe that, and, and I've said this many times, I believe that all of Scripture has an intended interpretation. We discussed it the other day. I believe it was the, the two of us. Um, how many believe that God's a liar? How many believe that? How many believe that God has ever told someone to lie? God has. If you talk to someone and you tell them to tell a lie, does that not mean that you have sinned? God's a liar. We can debate it and I will win every time. God told Samuel to anoint a new king, and he told Samuel, Samuel said, if I go and Saul finds out, he's going to kill me. And he says, well, then tell him you're here to offer a heifer and sacrifice the heifer and go do, tell, go do what I told you to do. Is there any debating that God told Samuel to lie to Saul? No, I took everything out of context. God says, go anoint a king. And Samuel said, I'm worried, God. And he said, for your sake, offer a heifer. When God walks up there, or if Samuel were, or Saul were to ask you, which he's not going to, tell him I'm here to offer a sacrifice unto the Lord. I can twist Scripture. We have to be very careful with that. God's Word is forever settled. We have a responsibility to preach and teach the Word of God. We ought to be a part of a great church. But He is also interested in building a home for your family. Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. It takes hard work. It takes a good, a good general contractor. There's no magic wand when it comes to uh, the matter of marriage and family. Most of us would like to have a magic wand or take words back that maybe you said, like a meaner than a striped rattlesnake. Maybe something like that probably didn't come out the way it ought to be. Uh, uh, with that, I'll let you know how things happen. Um, uh, we would have celebrated 34 years, but this young man passed away early. Uh, with that, a few days short of this time. It would be wonderful to marry and have everything wonderful, but that's not the way it works. Do you know that a wedding is a piece of cake? It's easy. It just takes a few moments, but marriage and family will take a lifetime. A wedding is an event, a marriage and family is an accomplishment. Now, I believe that Solomon understood what it takes and the work that it takes to have family. Now, I understand all of his wives and everything else, but he wrote in God's Word except the Lord. I, I believe that God would also have us Understand that we cannot have a strong family without His Word. I don't want to push religion upon my children. Don't push religion upon your, work, upon your children. Religion takes people to hell. Use the Word of God. 
lead them. I, was, uh, I, I went up and helped my brother one day this week, and he is a herdsman. I grew up, I was born and reared on a, a large dairy beef operation, and uh, cows, there's something about cows. They're stupid, and they don't follow you. You say, okay, come on with me, unless you coax them with grain or something. You can say, okay, come on with me. They are not going to follow you. They're called a herdsman. You drive cattle, but you cannot drive sheep. If you try to drive sheep, they will scatter. You lead sheep. You say, hey, come with me, and the sheep will follow. How do you get your children in church? You be in church. And when you get home for lunch, don't have pastor in the church for lunch. Have your lunch and praise God for what he's done. Well, I just disagree with what pastor said. Now, let me tell you something, kids. Let me tell you something, parents. You're going to destroy your family. If you, it, listen, I'll say this. If you have something you disagree with what I've said, don't come and say, I disagree with you. Come and bring proof that I was wrong. Well, I disagree. Listen, we've, we've, we've sung this song before. God said it. I believe it, and that settles it. How many of you have heard that song? God said it, that settles it, whether I believe it or not. I don't have to agree with God for something to be right. So when it comes to the home, there's a few things. Turn back to Genesis chapter 2 for a moment. And uh, for the home, for parents, dad, mom, bring your children to church. Bring your grandchildren. My, our grandchild is in the air flying, and, and it's, it's, I mean, it's been forever since I've seen her. It's been like yesterday. Um, and FaceTimed last night. But uh, you, you look at uh, your children, and now with grandchildren, and, and just how blessed we are. I want to give you a couple basic building blocks upon which to build a solid family foundation. First of all, it has to be, it has to be a God-oriented foundation. Look back at Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Now, God said it's been good. Everything that he has done has been good. But he says, it's not good that the man should be alone. He says, I will make him and help me. God is saying, I will be the building block. I will make the building block for a good family. Now, this verse teaches us that in order to have a good family, you have to have a God-oriented foundation. The key phrase is, I will make. Now, I was reading through this study, and I saw something really interesting. I want you to look back at verse 15. It says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. There's something interesting in this verse that I saw and again I won't argue with you on it. I believe it's true. Do you know, I, I want you to listen to this for a moment. Do you know that God never intended for us to know evil? Ever. But God never intended for us to know good. He never intended us for us to know good. He never intended us for us to know evil. He intended for us to know God. God is good, but God is perfectly good. You're going to have some good food today. We're going to have some good food today. We're having good fellowship today. In building a marriage, it's not about building a good marriage or some have built an evil marriage, it's about building a God marriage. 
God has to be the center of it. Again, God never intended us to know good. God never intended us to know evil. God intended for us to know Him because if you go on in chapter 3, He says that uh, it was in the cool of the day that He was walking. He says, where art thou? And He says, I hid myself. God intended for them to have fellowship with Him. The first family was formed by God. It was founded by His power. It was sanctioned by His authority. So you have to have an adequate authority for your family. There has to be authority. You know, we live in what we would say. How many say we have a free nation? That's a lie. The land, the home of the brave, the land of the free. True or false? False. We have freedom within boundaries. God gave Adam and Eve freedom within boundaries. Don't touch that tree. In the day that you eat it, it's gonna, you're going to die. God says you want to have a good home, then you have to live within these boundaries. You step outside of the boundaries, you lose the freedom of God's blessings. And so when you look at a God-oriented family, God has to be the authority. Everything has to have leadership and authority in order for it to work. What does the Bible say in Judges? And in that day there was no king in Israel. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Why do you have rules? To keep people right. Now, there are some rules that I totally disagree with. I understand that man-made, but not God-oriented rules. Now, every family is built upon some source of authority. There are some bases by which you build your family, by which you make your decisions, by which you determine the value system of your family. Now, there's basically two directions that you can turn to when it comes to what will be your source of authority in your family. One place you can turn to the culture or internal, um, internal uh, teaching and direction. You know, most people will dictate or, or, or they will imitate how they were raised. The home that you were brought up in, those characteristics will be carried out in your home. My son was giving me a hard time here about a month ago. He was there and his, his daughter was, was crying. And uh, he says, girl, you better stop crying or I'm going to give you something to cry about. And he looked at me and laughed. And I thought, what stupid parent would ever say that, son? He just smiled. I remember, boy, you better quit your crying or I'll give you something to cry about. You better stop that. And he laughed. I said, don't carry that characteristic out. But you got to understand, you were, you were a bad child, so I had to say that. Uh, the granddaughter is perfect. You know, there's a difference. But you will imitate what your home many times is. Not always. What makes the difference when you look at the bad characteristics and say, I don't want that? You come from a materialistic home. That's going to be your upbringing. You look at the, um, if you were raised in a good Christian home, I, I praise the Lord that I was born and reared in a good Christian home. My parents are both saved. The, the importance of church and the importance of the Bible has been a part of my life, uh, my, my whole life. Some of the first verses that I learned was, be sure your sins will find you out. I'm like, seriously, Mom, can you not teach me that I will love you forever with no discipline? Now, I can't find that in Scripture, but it sounds good. I mean, we learned... Scripture, we did not get Scripture forced upon us. We were led to church. We were brought to church. You know, the Bible has been important in our home. It still is. That would be a good foundation on which to build our family is the Word of God. Of 
Of course, it is, it is a sad thing that there are some children who leave those kinds of godly families that were reared in a good home and they follow the, uh, the tendencies of the world and they run from everything that is godly. You know, for instance, if your family was built on materialism, if material possessions were the most important thing in your family, that is a bad pattern to follow. I remember uh, Mr. Adams was a, a uh, he was a, his father was a, a theologian, or not a theologian, he was a, uh, an attorney, had a tremendous uh, mind in uh, the matter of law, and he wrote a book, and his son, and, and I have the illustration on my desk, and, and the son was standing before a judge, and the judge was a, a close friend of his father. And he was going to be sentenced for a crime that he had done. And he says, son, he says, I remember your father. I remember what a good man he was, what a, a good person he was. He says, you know, I remember uh, the time that he'd taken. He wrote a tremendous book that has helped so many judges, so many lawyers, so many attorneys. He says, what do you know and what can you say about your father? And he says, you look at him, your honor, as a good attorney but I look at him as a lost friend. Every time I'd go to my father, he would say, go away, son, I have work to do. I would come later and he'd say, son, I don't have time for your question. Go away, I have work to do. He says, you look at a good writer. I look at a lost friend and the judge. Alas, the book was written, but the boy was lost. What is important in our homes is spending time with our families. If you saw a family argument, whoever yelled the loudest got the most violent one. That's why there's a lot of abuse in the home. Let me say this, no man should ever hit his wife. My wife and I have been married 34 years next week or this week, and I have never, ever, raised my hand against my wife, ever. I don't believe in it. I believe that you, you won't walk up and punch your boss at work. Now, you may feel like it once in a while, but you won't act out in, in, in a situation like that. Why do we do it at home? Wives, you also. You also ought not. But if God is the center of both of your lives, there's going to be some unity there. You also may have the source of authority in the culture around us, and that's external. You know, the, 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 the culture in which we live has been brainwashed. They allow the media or the standards of the so-called celebrities of our day to serve as the basis for our own standards. They allow the culture to determine how they will behave in their family. The media elites in America today are making a concrete effort to destroy the home. Well, you know, this basketball player, oh man, if I could be like him or if I could be like their family or, or look at this Hollywood star and, and look at this and look at this. Why don't we just look to the Bible? You can pick up and look in the news any anytime you want to. And this couple's been married for 17 years and they're divorcing hell, uh, you know, Hollywood stars. Well, to me, I, I don't look at them as elites. I don't look at them for uh, a source of, of, of marital counseling and marital uh, uh, help. I look at God's Word. I don't have their posters in my room. I don't have them in my garage. Never have. We ought not look at them as the source of our information. We ought not look at the world and the worldly ideals as saying, hey, here's how a good marriage is built. Throw the Bible out. No, why don't we throw everything else out and just pull the Bible? If God is the creator and God is the orienter of marriage, then a strong family has to have the Lord as part of it. The Bible says again in 18, And the Lord God said, I will make 
What is he going to make? Marriage is a divine institution. Family is a divine institution. Listen, a bunch of cavemen didn't get together and say, hey, let's just have a marriage. Let's have a family. It came from God. Yes, you can learn a lot from books, but God's Word has to be the foundation for your home. Dad and Mom, start reading your Bible. Start having devotions in your home. Take your cell phones and, and put them in a, in a basket on the shelf or something and say, this is our time with God and we're going to spend some time with God. And you read God's Word and you talk about it and you have a wonderful time as a family. You ever go into a restaurant and watch? My wife gets mad at me because I look at people. I watch people. Stop staring. I can't help it. Well, you're making a fool out of yourself. I know, but I just don't think they can see me. I'm covering my face. You know, and it's like that. The wife sits down and she looks at her text message and it's from her husband who is sitting next to her. Would you please go get me a drink? <laughs> what? Why are you texting me? Why, why don't you just get it yourself? But everyone's on the cell phone. There's no communication. There's no... How many of you came from a home where you ate your meal and you had to sit there until you had permission to leave? You didn't eat your meal and take off. You stayed there as a family. And when the meal was completely done, you'd either have devotions or you'd talk a few moments. We need to get back to the family. Back to the home. God has given us a book. In this Bible, there are principles, precepts, and promises. God must be the first and final authority in which we build the house. But also, it is a goal-oriented foundation. Marriage is a God-oriented foundation, but it is also a goal-oriented foundation. Look at back at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be what? One flesh. Now God gave Eve to Adam and they were brought together as husband and wife and were married. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. What is the goal of marriage? The goal of marriage is oneness. The goal of marriage is togetherness. The goal in marriage is a family unity. The goal is to leave and to cleave. Now the Lord is saying here that there is a temporary relationship. The temporary relationship is, is children who live in the home and there comes a point in time where they leave the home and they establish their own home. So you have a temporary and you have an eternal earthly home as well or you could say a permanent relationship. Now the word leave here, what does it mean? It means to depart from. You depart from that temporary home and you establish your own home. Now I'm going to say something else that will get me in trouble. Now the Bible says that, you know, for this cause shall a man, 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 leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. You see, the man leaves, but the woman doesn't. She's always with her parents. I've heard that before. Now let me burst your bubble. A woman was created for one reason, to be a completer for the man. If you look at history, you look at tradition, biblical tradition, now understand, I'm not, don't you get your, I see some of your, your guys' minds started to wake up and roll, say, thank you, preacher, she's nothing. No, 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 she's everything. The home had to prepare her to be the godly wife to her husband. She was to be prepared in cooking, cleaning, sewing, 
If you read Proverbs 31, who can find a virtuous woman? For her prize is far above rubies. And you go on and read that her husband does safely trust in her. Her children rise up and call her blessed. So the woman was created as a completer to the man. Now, does that mean that man can't clean? You ought to. You ought to help in the home. Isn't it amazing when we first get married? I mean, we help our wife do everything just to be close to them. And now, I remember dating, and I went to college, and I lived in Indiana for a little while. My wife was in Virginia. And we would talk on the phone for a couple hours about nothing. Literally, what did you talk about? I don't know, but I was talking to her. Now, what does she want? Yeah, what do you want? I'm busy. What are you doing? Never mind. What do you want? How many of you remember when we used to spend time with our wives? Now, many of us still do. I understand that. Many of us enjoy, but you look at the world around us, and they're just a, they're, they're, they're a legalized slave in our home. They do the work in the home, and well, because that's what God's Word teaches. That's not what God's Word teaches. The God, God's Word says she's a completer, she's a helper. There ought to be unity in the home. There ought to be oneness in the home. God created us as a team. You take a, a basketball team or a football team, and if something goes bad, it always is on the coach. If something goes good, then they'll start talking about the assistants and stuff. But the coach is the final authority. But he has all of those around helping. And so when you look at this oneness and you look at this leaving and cleaving, the wife leaves her home, the, 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 the husband leaves his home, they establish a new home where the husband is the authority figure and the husband leads the home in accordance to God's word. It's a goal-oriented foundation. You know, uh, if you're going to have a good marriage and the goal in a good family, there has to be compatibility in the family. Now, this is the one big myth about a family. We got married, and Pastor, you'll never believe this. But Mitch, you will not believe this. We are 100% compatible. They <laughs> now laugh. Yeah, okay. Give it two weeks. Pastor. This woman is not the same one I married. She went to bed smiling and she woke up with murder on her face. <laughs> like, yep, welcome to marriage. What do I do? Throw chocolate at her. I don't know. It worked for me. <laughs> you know, the bigger the candy bar, the better. If you, if you, now, listen, you should never hit a woman unless it's with a candy bar. <laughs> they will forgive you on that one. If it's a big bar, they're like, ouch, that hurt, but I'll forgive you eating this chocolate candy bar. Now, don't throw something she doesn't like. You know I don't eat this chocolate. That's bad news. Get something she likes. And she'll use this term. Oh, you know I shouldn't have this. I am on a diet. Well, I'll take it back. No, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. I'll dispose of it in a good way. Now, I know that we, we laughing and, and being facetious here, but the fact is, is there ought to be compatibility, but that compatibility comes through a lot of work. My wife and I are a lot more compatible today than what we were 34 years ago. In fact, I love my wife more today than I did a year ago and 10 years ago and 15 years ago. The more time we spend with each other, the more time that, that we do things together and pray together and spend time in God's Word. I have a personal prayer list. She has a personal prayer list. We have a marital prayer list that we pray for. We spend time together. It's a goal-oriented. What is the goal? We want to have unity with us, but we also want to make sure that we are a reflection of Christ to our children and our granddaughter. 
I want, I want to hear God say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But I would love to have my grandchildren say, my grandpa was a godly man. My grandpa loved the Bible. My grandpa read the Bible to me. My grandpa sang Christian songs to me. My grandpa didn't play junk and, and rock music and wickedness in front of me. My grandpa was a godly man. That is a goal that I'm reaching toward. Again, it has to be goal-oriented. It takes a lifetime of marriage to develop compatibility. The same thing is true in a family. When children are born, uh, they are all different. You know, here are two children who have the same mother and father, and they are totally opposite. How many of you have children like that? I have two boys. They are not the same. I don't know where my one came from. <laughs> and he looks like me. <laughs> I wonder where he came from. If you see our wedding picture and you say, man, that's Brandon. Tad, when he was younger, well, even he's very tender, even today. Growing up, that's enough. Man, he'd break down. My other one, that's enough. Coach coming off. You want to you want to you want to do something about it? <laughs> Bring it, <laughs> boy. You're just three. Yeah, I know, but I'm ready. Let's go. We'll do it. <laughs> you're like, yep. That's his mama's boy right there. Brandon, we would have to discipline and put him to bed. Oh, that was murder. You thought you'd killed him. You couldn't discipline him and let him go because he would. Then he would. Try to say, okay, what can I do to get the victory? And if you threw him in bed, it was like, you're just giving him time to think. But if you disciplined him, you gave him time to think about what had just happened, and he's like, okay, I don't want to do this. We'll just do right. He's still uh, one that is like, I got to think about this. Hmm. But you learn your children, and you know how to... To, to interact with them. Now listen, I don't think that, I don't believe that spanking is the only uh, way to discipline. I love what was said the other day listening, and, 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 and listen, we said, and, and is, that, is that the type of attitude we ought to have? No, ma'am. Do you want me to help it change, or do you want to change? I'll change it. You don't always have to discipline. Sometimes you need time out. Sometimes you may need to take something away from them. But there is an area in the body that God did create that does help remind them. It, it's amazing when that is heated up, the wax in the ear seems to uh, melt away. Sometimes it jump starts the, the, uh, the brain. That was not a good idea. I don't think I want that again. What is the goal? The goal of a marriage is oneness, unity. What is the goal of having children? To rear them up in the nature and admonition of the Lord, so that when they leave the home, they are going to establish a godly home that is a reflection of the home that they left. Because they learned from their parents, which learned from their parents. What is your goal with your family? To raise highly educated children who don't know God? Or is your goal to raise children who love God? Now, education is wonderful, but it starts in God's Word. It starts with the Bible. And so he's talking about commitment here. Matthew chapter 19 says, What God hath joined together, let, my, let not man put asunder. The word join means to be glued together, to be stuck together. It's a bond is, that is so strong that it cannot be broken without serious damage done to both pieces. So he's talking about commitment. I believe the number one requirement for a strong family is commitment. When you marry, you are committed to your wife. When you marry, you're committed to your husband. A woman with a man, a man with a woman. It's not a man and a man and a woman and a woman. That is sodomy. This is not gay pride. It's sodomy. The reason they have the rainbow, it's blasphemy 
to God saying, hey, listen, I know what your symbol that you gave in Genesis, and we're going to wave it in your face. The rainbow has seven stripes, the number of completion, the number of perfection. The, 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 the pride flag has six, which is the number of the world, the number of Satan. God's going to deal with them. Let's not say, well, they're just a bunch of gays. We have No, they're sodomites. They can be saved, but they cannot be saved and continue in that. They will leave it. But that's with all sin. We must leave where we are. That's what the Bible says in, in, in Ephesians. You who were dead hath been quickened, which was brought to life spiritually. And so you have a commitment. Husbands, love your wives. Only look at your wives. You know, when the children come along, you are committed to those children. You're committed to one another. You're committed for the long haul. Every part of that family needs to be glued together. Listen, children are not a, a uh, uh, I just had the word, they are not a, a distraction. They're not, listen, uh, we had children. Now my life is forever ruined. No. One, one man, he put it, he kept a diary. And he put in his diary, he says, went fishing with my son today, caught nothing. It was a day wasted. The son wrote in his diary, and the father happened to pick up his diary, and it said in, the, in it, it says, went fishing with my dad today, the greatest day of my life. Children, how do you spell love? T-I-M-E. That's what you spell with, with children, time. Well, I tried to give them some good quality. It might be five minutes. Why don't you give them some quantity? Nothing in this life is more important. I was listening to a, a, a podcast from, from a, a man who's worth hundreds of millions. And the man asking him questions, he says, what is the greatest accomplishment in your life? He said, well, let me tell you, it's not what the world thinks. The greatest accomplishment in my life is that my adult children come over and hang out with me and call me dad. It's the greatest accomplishment. Money means nothing without a family. That's the greatest thing in my life. Your children want you to spend some time with them. You want to build. What's the goal? That they are a duplicate of you. I said to a young lady this morning, I said, hey, I, I go by your house and I see this beautiful young lady out working in the yard and doing some things. And they said, oh, you must have been talking about your mother. Uh, it was probably a reflection of their mother. But a smile always on their face. And I think that, that's, that's what a home ought to be. The last thing here is a grace-oriented foundation. Look at verse 25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. But I want you to read the next verse in Genesis chapter 2, verse 26. Let's read verse 25 again. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. In verse 26 it says, and they lived happily ever after. How many of you see that in your Bible? You don't have it in yours? I do have chapter 3, and it's not happily ever after. Perfection was tainted by sin. God was the foundation of marriage. How many agree with that? The day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Spiritually and physically, they started dying. But in all of judgment, from Genesis to Revelation, in all of judgment, God always shows grace. Always. He did kick them out of the garden. And the Bible says at the entrances of the garden, He put cherubims. What were they holding? Swords. The sword is a symbol of judgment. 
The cherubim's a symbol of grace. God said, I have to judge you, but I will show grace. We hear this phrase that uh, we are living in the age of grace. That is not biblical. We've always lived in grace. We're in the church age. Noah found grace. Adam and Eve found grace. Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel. Cain found grace. God judged him, but He gave him grace. Yes, God ought to be the author of the home, the foundation. Our goal ought to be a biblical home. But sometimes it doesn't always go that way. And so what do we have to have a grace-oriented home? Genesis 3, you see in chapter 2, the last verse, they were both naked and unashamed. In chapter 3, verse 10, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. In Genesis 3, we have the sad record of the first family and the entrance of sin into their family and into the human race. Man became a sinner. Why? Because Adam became a sinner. Sin was brought into this world not by Eve. It was brought into the world by Adam. Adam's sin brought sin into the world, and through that it is passed upon all mankind. Eve did wrong. God would have dealt with her had Adam not eaten of the fruit. But God knew before the foundation what was going to take place. And before the foundation of the world, God already predestined or foreordained that He was going to send His Son to die on the cross. But Adam brought sin into the world. Eve became a sinner because Adam brought sin into the world. One of the things that you have to understand to have a strong family foundation is that we are all sinners. Now, I hate to say this. If you are married, you married a sinner. Your spouse is a sinner. Something else we have to realize is that we are selfish. You say, well, that's not true. Adam and Eve were. What did Adam say when he was confronted with this sin? Look, look over at chapter 3. In, in, in verse number 10, and they, were, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam, his wife, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord uh, God amongst the trees in the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said... Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. God, it's your fault. If you hadn't given me this woman... Maybe if you'd have given me a perfect woman, really? I wouldn't have done this. Eve ate of the fruit ignorantly. Adam ate of the fruit willfully. Adam knew what he was doing. I know we've joked and said things. What is the first mystery meal? What, what is the uh, a wife says, hey, I just made this new recipe. What do you think of it? Now, you have a decision to make, husband. You can be happy or you can be dead. Happy is good. Now, listen, the ladies in here, I have tasted your food. It's wonderful. But don't raise your hands. Keep them down, but just look at me, married men. I'm not even looking at my wife. How many of your wives have ever made a plate that you're like, if she never makes this again, it's okay. It's okay. Here's something that'll really get you killed. It's good, but not as good as my mother's. Oh, man, you might as well just, if you're looking for a wife and you get married, don't ever say that to her. 
It's good, but not as good as my mother's. And she'll say, then why don't you just go to your mother's and eat that? And probably some other things. He said, it's the woman. When he asked Eve, she said, it's the snake. Adam knew what he did. Listen, sin does not come into our home unexpectedly. We already know that it's present. The Bible says, ye did run well. What did hinder you? Or does it say, who did hinder you? What's don't hinder? Who's hinder? We have to, it says in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Satan has to ask permission to bring sin into your home. It's present, do you allow it? We have to understand that sin is always present. And the Bible says... In verse 21, and unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make clothes of skin and, 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 and clothe them. What's that? It's a picture of salvation. It's a picture of grace. Grace covered their nakedness. Grace covered their sin. Not only are we all sinners and we are all selfish, but we are also all damaged goods. But praise God, we're salvageable. How? By the grace of God. Folks, there's a lot of people that sin can get a hold of their life and they can fall. They can turn from God. What is our job as a church? Show them grace. Not condone wrongdoing, but don't condemn the person. You take the sodomite movement. I cannot hate them because of God's word. But I cannot condone them because of God's word. I'll preach against sin, and I don't know if it passed or if they're going to try to put it through this week in Michigan where you cannot, a pastor or anybody, cannot preach or teach against homosexuality or the sodomy and, and on all of these things. It's, it's a prison sentence of five years. Free speech is as if we agree with them. We have to understand sin is present, but I will still teach my children wrong. I'll teach them, well, we need to preach on that. Well, what about our own sins? Well, what, what, is, what is, how about our own sins? Oh, we can preach about abortion. We can preach about sodomy. We can preach about cussing and swearing. We can preach about rock music. Now, don't mention country. But how about faithfulness to church? Do you read your Bible every day? If you don't, that's sin. The Bible doesn't say if you would like to. The Bible says we're to meditate upon the Word of God daily. We're to spend time with God daily, pray without ceasing. It's still sin. We need to make sure that what we are doing in our home is, is God-oriented, goal-oriented, but also grace. I think one of the greatest examples in the Bible of grace and a grace-oriented family is the story of the prodigal son. In Luke 15, verse 12, the boy said to the father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. He proved that he was a sinner and proved that he was selfish. With a broken heart, the father gave the boy his inheritance. The boy took off, and the Bible says that he joined himself. He joined himself to the things of the world. He joined himself to the ungodly. Some of uh, the same word I use early, he glued himself to it. You know what happened? The son found out that those people that he was glued to didn't care about him when the money ran out. And all of a sudden, he was eating with the pigs, literally. Now, we have a welfare program, so we don't have to have God. We don't need anything because we can just get everything from the taxpayer. You know the best way to, to solve the unemployment project or problem or that the, they say that there's more jobs than there are people to fill them. There's an easy way to fill them. Just take food stamps away. But you'll get yourself in trouble for that. There are times that we need to help people. But what happened? He, he, he had nothing left. 
And he came back to his father and paraphrasing, he says, listen, I don't deserve to be called your son anymore. It would be better, he's saying, listen, I don't deserve to be called dad's son anymore. Uh, even if I'm a servant, even if I'm a slave, uh, even the servants ate better than what I'm eating right now. I'm going to go back home. And it's wonderful to read the story because when his father saw him, he ran up to him and he says, you lousy, rotten piece of garbage, you piece of trash, you left this home, you made an embarrassment out of me, you made a mockery out of me, your brother has to stay here and work hard. He says, what in the world are you doing here? Why don't you turn around and go back to that far country where you came from because you're a piece of garbage? Now, I don't read that in Scripture. I do read where the father ran to his son and put shoes on his feet, a ring on his finger, and a coat around him. And he says, Dad, I don't deserve it. He said, even though you've left, you've never stopped being my son. He said, kill the fatted calf. Why, he once was lost and now he's found. And his son came back. Now understand, he was not restored to the same position. There was baggage had altered his life. But he never ceased to be a son. We never cease to be a child of God once we're truly saved. A person cannot go out and sin. You say, I don't even believe in backsliding. I believe that that's a lie. Listen, if you backslide away from God, you're not going to enjoy it. And if you do enjoy that wickedness, I have to question your salvation. But let me also say there's another part in closing. You have the prodigal's brother who was a little angry at the father and said, but what about me? You've never given to me. You've never killed the fatted calf too for me. And you can look at that and say, no, but you've been blessed every day with what I've given you. He's lived in misery. But we also need to reward good behavior not just discipline bad behavior. We need to thank our children for the good things they do. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. I said to my son the other day, I was gone and I was helping. And usually if I'm gone, they'll call their mother and say, hey, you want to come over for supper? And she'll go over to their house for supper. And I said to him, thank you so much for taking care of my wife like you do. Thank you. What is a home? It's built on the foundation of God's Word. It has a goal oriented that we're just going to build this house upon God's Word. But if someone falls away, let's show some grace and try to get them back. Maybe salvation's the most important thing. But maybe they just need someone to come along beside them. You never know the story behind the person we judge by the outside, but God sees the heart. Like the young lady I talked to the other day. Her mom passed away at 13 years old. Dad's out of the scene. And now her mom is dead. How do you react? Well, just live for God. That's easier said than done from a young person. We need to show grace to people. You see... If you want to build a family with a God-oriented foundation, you need to have God-oriented family. That gives the family authority. You need a goal-oriented family. That gives the family unity. You need to have a grace-oriented family. That gives a family beauty. What's going on in your family? Are there needs that need to be addressed? Is there things that need to be forgiven? There needs maybe some grace extended. In this day and age, let's let not, let's not let the world tell us what we need. Let's let God tell us what we need. I'm not going to allow that in here or in my home. Why? Because I know what God's Word teaches. The Bible has to be the center 
of our home. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, I pray that you will be with us here this morning. I know the time and I see how late it is. But Lord, I pray that we will make you the foundation. We allow you to help us build the house. But also, as you showed to Adam and Eve, as you showed to Cain, as you showed to all through the Bible, you always showed grace. Sin is forgiven, but sin also has to be dealt with. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Lord, thank you for saving. I know my soul. My eternal home is heaven. But as long as I'm here on earth, I want to have a God-fearing, God-loving family. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, nobody's looking around. Maybe someone here this morning is...